Okay, it's it's um, such an honor to um, to come and talk tonight, um, and to have so many people from all across the globe coming together. Um, so I'd just like to first off um, acknowledge my co-collaborators on this project. Uh, my PhD is a collaboration of work um, between the University of Sydney, um, where I'm currently a doctoral student, um, Griffith University in Queensland, and the Gold Coast University Hospital, where I, I work as a speech pathologist as well. Um, so voice disorders are common, but often underreported. They impact on the physical, emotional, social and employment well-being of an individual. And one in 13 people affected by voice disorders work in public facing jobs where they rely on their voice for an income. So studies from the US and Australia have demonstrated that up to 63% of patients with voice disorders may miss at least one day of work per year and 4.8% will miss more than six days of work per year. So a voice disorder can be costly to both health service and also society. One example, maybe um, from the, a study from the US, which demonstrated that um, the cost of assessment alone is, in, uh, is estimated around 1 billion US dollars a year. And also we know from the Voice Care Network here in Australia um, have estimated the economic impact of voice disorders on teachers is approximately 52 million uh, Australian dollars per year. So early intervention is key to preventing decline and reducing healthcare costs. The classification of voice disorders is complex because not everybody perceives a good quality voice in the same way, as we all may know. And the symptoms may not always be obvious to the listener. Some research by Rebecca Warhurst and Kate Medill um, looked at radio broadcasters and demonstrated the significance of an individual's vocal performance can be seen through multiple lenses because multiple in individuals are involved in that communication um, exchange and they may all perceive the voice very differently. Etiology of voice disorders is multifactorial because a healthy functioning voice relies on a combination of physiological, biomechanical and aerodynamic mechanisms. Patients may compensate and mask the primary problem. Our assessments are largely subjective, even when instrumentation is included. And there is no global agreement on how we describe or classify a voice problem. Although we're looking, although there's a lot of research looking into that. Um, and more recently, um, our colleagues in Sydney, Kath Gregory and Jan Baker, have been looking at classification of functional voice problems. So dysphonia can be a symptom of an underlying serious or progressive medical condition. However, around 40% of patients referred for voice assessment are classified as functional dysphonia with no organic, structural or neurogenic cause. And those patients may well be the patients that come to speech and language pathology for intervention. So why does a voice sound disordered? We can hear a voice and perceptually tell that it sounds unnatural, but how do we prove that? And how do we quantify that? So our assessment needs to be multidimensional. We want to encapsulate the wide reaching effects of a voice disorder, so we as voice assessment specialists, we use uh, or interpret a combination of assessments um, and symptoms from a patient um, based through self-reporting tools, um, our detailed case history taking. And then we may well interpret signs from those patients using our functional voice assessments, including perceptual rating tools or laryngeal palpation or visualize visual imaging of the larynx. We use objective measures, acoustic analysis, aerodynamic assessment to perhaps quantify the subjective measures that we take from our voice. And those objective measures are coming, are looking to be more reliable in terms of differential diagnosis, although there's still quite a way to go from that. 
So in spite of this, there's a little evidence of any international agreed assessment criteria which exists for the combination of assessments that we need to use to quantify or classify a voice disorder. Direct visualization of the larynx or laryngoscopy is generally the accepted initial diagnostic assessment because it's likely to show pathology in the larynx. However, laryngoscopy is a brief assessment of structure and function of the larynx and the value of laryngoscopy is dependent on the ability of the clinician to interpret its findings. And we know from studies in the US um, from uh, that up to 50% of patients um, may have a change in diagnosis um, based on specialty voice assessment through an MDT um, using stroboscopy. So there are several drivers that may lead to change in the way in which we approach assessment of voice. First of all, we have an increasing expanding population, particularly in Australia. It's expanding by about approximately 1.6% annually, and only 43% of those patients, uh, or 43%, um, or uh, excuse me, don't have any private health cover. So they rely on the public health system for their assessment. Waiting times for assessment in public health systems are much longer than clinically recommended here in Australia. Delayed assessment increases healthcare costs, it delays treatment, and with delayed treatment, we risk symptom decline. And we're looking to have high value and lower cost care. That's the way in which we're encouraged to deliver efficient healthcare services globally. So according to the Australian Productivity Commission, simply expanding the current workforce is not enough. We need to adopt new ways of working to make care more efficient and cost effective, shifting from volume-based care to value-based care, focusing on improving um, outcomes, but with reduced costs. So allied health professionals expanding their scope with knowledge and skills they have already, or extending their scope in some places, can work to develop more efficient models in line with the multidisciplinary team. For example, for patients with voice disorders, the typical pathway in the Australian public system is a referral from GP to ENT for initial assessment, including case history and laryngoscopy. Laryngoscopy is needed to rule out organic pathology but its use in classifying a voice disorder beyond this is inconclusive. So we recommend assessment is multidisciplinary, including both ENT and speech language pathology as a minimum, using multidimensional assessments to encapsulate the complexity of the voice disorder. In specialist centers or certain research centers, combined MDT clinics or voice clinics exist to utilize the skills of both ENT and speech and language pathologists. However, the problem with the public health care system in Australia is there's a lack of subspecialist ENTs. MDT clinics are not readily available for all patients in the public system, and patients wait longer than clinically recommended for their ENT outpatient appointment, and that delays their access to treatment as well. So the speech and language pathology first contact clinic is a model where patients can be triaged quickly. The speech and language pathologist is the first contact, contact conducting routine clinical assessments, including video stroboscopy, prior to a medical review and case discussion for confirmed diagnosis. This model can ensure ENT surgeons use their expertise on more complex cases and surgical interventions and the patients receive assessment and treatment of their voice disorder much earlier. This model was first described by Professor Paul Carding in 2005 and is available in centers in the UK. And our model at the Gold Coast Hospital is based on some work by Marnie Seabrook uh, at Logan Hospital in Queensland. So our triage system is a two phase system all referrals are triaged by a surgical registrar and then screened by the advanced speech and language pathologist for inclusion. All of the referrals are referrals into the hospital service from the GP. 
We aim to capture all of the patients who will likely benefit from the primary speech and language pathology intervention in the speech and language pathology first contact clinic or the SLPFC. So any suspected category one patients or any conditions that, deemed, that are deemed re, uh, to require surgical intervention are triaged into the general ENT clinics or into the MDT voice clinic. So we measured service outcomes of patients seen in this SLPFC clinic in the first 12 months of inception. We saw 153 patients in the dysphonia pathway of the speech and language pathology primary contact clinic. And these, um, these outcomes are currently um, waiting review for publication. Our, com our comparison group for the patients seen in the SLPFC were patients who were seen by ear, nose and throat doctors in the 24 months prior to implementation of the pathway. And they were matched with the study group for age, symptoms at the time of referral, and triage category. A linear regression analysis demonstrated that patients in the ENT group waited much longer than those in the SLPFC group, and that wait times reduced by an average of 277 days per patient for those seen in the SLPFC. 81% of the speech and language pathology first contact pathway did not require further ENT assessment or management after case discussion. They received an average of two occasions of service by the speech and language pathologist and 46% were referred on for voice treatment through our voice treatment service. Of the 29 patients who did return to ENT, this was mostly for management of unrelated symptoms not mentioned in the GP referral. So that included rhinosinusitis or hearing loss. However, for 7% of those patients returned, they were recategorized for urgent ENT assessment for um, reasons including organic pathology in the larynx or the pharynx, picked up through the laryngoscopy by the speech and language pathologist, or for thyroid investigations. They were subsequently seen by ENT after an average of 15 days, whereas they may otherwise have been sitting on the waiting list for many, many months. So perhaps the speech language pathology service is picking up patients that need more urgent uh, laryngoscopy with ENTs as well by seeing them faster. So this study demonstrates the speech and language pathology first contact provides a timely one-stop multidimensional assessment for eligible patients, and it supports faster access to the most relevant treatment pathway. However, this model is not readily available and it needs further research to develop, to understand which patients are most suitable for this type of service, the sensitivity of the speech pathology assessment approach, the predictive capability of the speech pathology assessments to identify patients who may need surgical intervention as well as speech pathology intervention, and the cost benefits within the Australian context. So given the current emphasis from the best practice guidelines on the need for laryngoscopy at the first contact assessment, there is obvious limitations to this model. And as a standalone assessment model, without, real, uh, without uh, reliance on ENT um, for that verifying of the assessment findings. So whereas laryngoscopy and direct visualization of the larynx by a medically trained ENT is critical element in the diagnostic process. Delays to accessing this assessment are common and may impede timely access to treatment. So we need to understand through further research how the SLP led model supports the MDT process of the voice evaluation with better utilization of services. So my PhD is to investigate the speech language pathology first contact assessment model for voice disorders and to provide evidence for what diagnostic information and clinical tests best identify patients with dysphonia suitable for speech pathology, and to establish if patients can reliably triage to a first contact first uh, voice assessment um, and receive the same treatment recommendations from a speech pathologist as an ENT. So I hope to determine uh, this model is a safe, reliable and cost effective way of, um, of assessing patients with voice disorders 
while they're waiting for that medical diagnostic diagnosis from ENT. But for now, we face a global challenge in the assessment and management of patients with voice disorders for, us, for the foreseeable future. The COVID-19 pandemic resulted in a temporary change to the way patients can access services for assessment. We in Australia have faced a reduction, and I know globally have faced a reduction in routine laryngoscopies for all but category one patients. A reduction in face-to-face -face appointments, um, which includes instrument, instrumental assessments or objective measurements with both ENT and speech pathology. And clinicians are being pulled into more critical acute care services, particularly our ENT colleagues. So the Speech Language Pathology First Contact Clinic is perhaps an alternative and immediate solution to manage patients who may otherwise be waiting for ENT first, uh, for ENT assessment and diagnosis. This model, albeit not fully shown to be reliable, may provide a temporary stopgap for patients waiting assessment with EMT. Application of a telehealth model of the first contact clinic is a way of providing multidimensional assessments while waiting for laryngoscopy, and it may be used as a stepwise, pro uh, stepwise pro approach to assist with the triaging of patients who may need more urgent laryngoscopy. So we've conceptualized an info guidance, which is, design, uh, which is developed from some of the work uh, from the speech and language pathology first contact model of voice assessment and the University of Sydney voice clinic assessment protocols. The aim of this is to standardize the assessment questions and, um, and the tests, clinical tests, to determine which signs and symptoms and measure our interpretation of how we classify a voice disorder from those most common symptoms and signs picked up through a routine clinical assessment, but without the instrumental and objective tests that we most often usually rely on. So it includes a triage or a, a group of triage or setup tools um, to help uh, identify patients that may be at more risk of voice disorders or, or urgent imminent assessment. We've standardized um, some of the case history information and a standard set of clinical measures that can be done through the telehealth medicine um, process, which we'll learn much more about tonight um, from uh, uh, Professor um, Tricia McCabe. And it includes a decision-making process for the classification um, of voice disorders based on the telehealth model, including the identification of any red flag symptoms. It's important to know that this is not designed as a diagnostic tool. Um, laryngoscopy and or stroboscopy needs to be encouraged as soon as operationally available. However, it's a way of meeting our patients' needs while they're waiting for that ENT diagnostic assessment, where we might also be able to um, provide some vocal health and some vocal treatment. So this is a work in progress. We plan to publish this guidance and then share it online uh, through a teaching module through the University of Sydney for those who are interested. So my final slide, whereas the beaches and the hinterland of the Gold Coast is empty, we hope to provide value and responsive care to our patients with voice disorders, despite the uh, crisis of the COVID-19. Thank you very much, everybody. And I'll be happy to take questions at the end of the, end of the evening. Thank you.